Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Royal Society of Medicine In Conversation series. It's lovely to have you with us. We have more than 700 people registered for this webinar, and uh, we have two very special guests. We have my good friend uh, and colleague, Sir Marcus Setchell, KCVO, uh, Royal Gynecologist to Her Majesty for um, many years. And we have Will Palin, son of Sir Michael Palin, who I gather is going to be watching this evening. So hello, Sir Michael. Will Palin uh, is linked with Sir Marcus uh, in the uh, ongoing restoration of the Great Hall uh, and Henry VIII Gate at St. Bartholomew's Hospital. And before that, uh, he was involved with the restoration uh, of the Painted Hall in Greenwich. So we'll be talking about uh, heritage buildings, restoration of Barts, the Great Hall, and uh, Greenwich as well. And But we'll start off with uh, Sir Marcus. And uh, Ma- Sir Marcus, you know, you and I have known each other for many, many years, maybe 30 years perhaps, uh, and, and I know you very well. But I think the audience probably won't know you quite as well as I do. I'm sure they won't. Uh, tell us a little bit about how does one get to be the royal gynecologist, uh, surgeon and gynecologist to Her Majesty. I mean, there's a long and interesting history about that post. And just just tell us a little bit about how you acquired that position. I will, Roger, but I will just also say Sir Marcus once and for then thereafter, for goodness sake, Marcus. I said, tell everybody that. (laughs) It's lovely to have been given a title, but you don't want to... (laughs) I don't need to use it all the time. Um, So how did I get the job? Well, I've absolutely no idea. Um, The, uh, I don't think the method of choice or method of selection uh, is always the same. Uh, And so I don't really know at all uh, how how I did, why I was selected. All I can tell you is that it wasn't an invitation and it wasn't an appointment. It was a command. Right. And I suddenly received a phone call saying that I would be getting this command uh, shortly. Uh, and there arrived a scroll which I have on my wall, uh, which uh, is described as uh, by the Queen's command, uh, I am appointed to the place and quality of surgeon gynecologist to the Queen. Uh, and then it goes on to give a job description that is to have, hold, exercise, uh, and enjoy the said place. It's a placement, really, not an appointment, uh, together with all rights, profits, privileges, and advantages thereunto belonging. <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, one of the main privileges uh, has been that since retirement and knighthood, I'm quite useful to charities and I've enjoyed a second career uh, working with charities. And Marcus, there is a link, of course, with the Royal Society of Medicine. I mean, Sir George Pinker was your predecessor, I I think, and was also president of the Royal Society of Medicine. And you've been involved with the RSM uh, obstetrics and gynecology section. I think you were president of uh, the Yes, section. indeed, yeah. So just tell us a little bit about Sir George, because actually he was one of my teachers when I uh, left Cambridge to come to the Middlesex. He was uh, on the staff of the Soho Hospital for Women. Uh, I think now that's a, uh, a film studio or something uh, now in Soho yeah. Square. But tell us a little bit about Sir George, because he, he was a bit of a character. He was a wonderful chap. Uh, I never worked for him. Um, uh, and um, I got to know him actually because <laughs> my wife was his patient for the birth of our second child. Uh, and then we also became friends through an organization that began in the Royal Society of Medicine called the Gynecological Winter Study Group. And George was one of the found, foundation, foundation members of that. Uh, and uh, so I got to know him much better through that. Uh, and generally, uh, we always got on very well together. Um, but, you know, he, he didn't have any firsthand experience of my uh, clinical, uh, clinical skills or anything because we never actually worked together. 
But but was the link through the through the RSM perhaps or? Uh, well, I I I wouldn't not not. That was another strong point of connection for us. And when he was president, he uh, he was sadly beginning to have quite marked symptoms of his Parkinson's disease, uh, and uh, I was on the council at the time. Uh, uh, of the RSM and I used to sort of help him when there were um, trips to be made between his flat and the RSM. So, you know, we, we knew each other for really the whole of my uh, consultant life right up until he died. And he was, it was a loss of a, a great friend and mentor, uh, even though we'd never actually worked together. I must say he was the nicest te teacher. Well, since we're talking about George, um, uh, Sir George, uh, I know the audience will want me to, to ask you a few questions about uh, the royal family. Uh, uh, the, the crown is, is screening at the moment, so everybody's fascinated in stories relating to the royal family, although I'm not sure that uh, how accurate those depictions are. But the, the, the birth of the future King of England, I know you're not going to be indiscreet and tell us anything that we don't really already know, Marcus, but just whether it, and you, you did the announcement, I think, in front, in front of the gates of Buckingham Palace, if I remember. I, I think I saw a photograph of you. Well, you, you one, one doesn't do the announcement there, but you sign uh, an official document um, which is, has to be signed by the physician uh, in charge of the medical household um, and the uh, delivering doctor uh, and anaesthetist. Uh, and I think there was one other person present who had to sign this um, certificate, which then is delivered on a motorbike to um, uh, Buckingham Palace uh, and put up on a sort of blackboard in the easel. Uh, and I didn't go with the, the document, but I think some of the press would use a photo next door to the document of, the, of myself and the other doctors who were involved when we left the Lindo wing that evening. Well, Mary Hawkins asked a couple of questions. She, she wants to know whether you're still the uh, gynecologist, the Queen, but in fact, you have retired, haven't you? Well, t tell us a little bit about, about handing over and so on. Um, uh, well, I, I um, uh, retired, um, the, the actual wordings of the uh, appointment document uh, says until Her Majesty's pleasure, but uh, Her Majesty understood uh, that it was not sensible to remain in a position like that beyond uh, retirement age uh, and so um, I by the time I was 70 uh, she agreed to accept my uh, retirement from the post uh, and um, I can't really tell you anything very much about the handover either <laughs> because uh, other than the fact that about five years before I retired um, from the, that appointment I was retiring from the NHS and a very important part of the job is that you're responsible for the care uh, of in obstetrics and gynaecology for all the staff of the royal family. Uh, of course, some of them, if they lived far away, didn't choose to avail themselves of that. But the ones who uh, didn't have health insurance and so on, of course, would come to your NHS hospital. And so when I was retiring from the NHS, uh, I knew that it was going to be important to have uh, somebody else on board uh, who could uh, look after the NHS patients. Uh, and it was also a time when the specialty of obstetrics and gynaecology was splitting. And uh, today, many obstetricians uh, and gynaecologists only do either obstetrics or gynaecology. Um, and so I thought that it was going to be the right thing for the future to appoint somebody or to have somebody appointed who was a gynaecologist, uh, because that was the kind of work that was going to be needed um, to be done uh, in, NHS in NHS hospitals quite often. Uh, and so we saw the appointment of Alan Farthing as 
um, as, as, as sort of um, surgeon gynecologist to the household, uh, but not at that time to the royal family themselves. Uh, and then subsequently when I retired as an obstetrician as well, they appointed um, Guy Thorpe Beeston as um, to, to, to do the, be the obstetrician to the royal family. Well, we'll, we'll move on. Will, I, I'm not ignoring you. We're going to come over to, to Greenwich and, um, uh, and to the Great Hall any minute. But uh, before I do, uh, Sally Peel says hello. And Iman Khan says, what age did you begin working for the royal family, Marcus? How old were you when you started that job? Oh, uh, so that was the only thing that George Pinker was slightly annoyed about because I was a year or two younger than he was when he was appointed. <laughs> uh, and I think I was... Um, uh, if it was 90, uh, no, gosh, I can't remember what year it was. I did it for 24 years. Um, so uh, it, it must have been when I was 46. Does that work out right, I think? I think, um, yeah, 1990, I got it in your, I got your CV. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, 1990 to, nine, to 2013. Yeah, and Sally Peel, of course, I think, it, that must be the Sally Peel who is the widow of Sir John Peel. All right, yeah. Um, yes, she's yes. a wonderful lady, and, and I would like to say very best wishes. If <laughs> but there may be another Sally Peel, but she was a wonderful lady who saw Sir John Peel into uh, extreme great old age, and he was over a hundred uh, when he died. And it was a rather nice thing that he was the same year that he had lots of birthday celebrations of being a hundred. George Pinker was eighty and I was 60, so that rather sort of was a nice generational uh, pattern <laughs> to be seen at these parties. Well, just before we go over to Will, I just want to, uh, come, Victor, could you show those slides of uh, that some, Marcus has probably had the most energetic retirement of uh, any of the senior clinicians I know, but before he retired, he and I uh, engaged in a number of, of fundraising treks, and uh, this picture is of Petra. So, Marcus, tell us a little bit about uh, how you came up with the idea of that trek uh, across the Jordanian desert to Petra. <laughs> Well, you'd been trekking and cycling for years before I took this all up, I think. But um, I then uh, did um, a trek in the Sinai Desert for um, well-being of women. Uh, and uh, it was absolutely wonderful experience and I enjoyed it so much. And um, there were only six of us on the trek doing it for well-being of women because the uh, people who organized it said they'd take six people from various different char charities. Uh, and it was so enjoyable and so successful uh, and so relatively easy to raise funds from sponsorship that um, I, and I knew you did them. So I think we went and had a cup of tea in Regent's Park at lunchtime one day and thought that it would be a, a, a good idea to, have joint treks for uh, women's health charity, Wellbeing of Women, and the prostate charity uh, as well. And, and so we did that. And it was to our huge pleasure and, uh, and way beyond our imagination, 106 people came on that trek. And it set us up for a series of, what, six, seven joint treks running over 10 or 12 year period. <laughs> well, I know I know quite a few of the people who are on some of those tracks will be watching this tonight. So next, can I show the next slide, Victor? Yeah, um, Marcus, can you explain why you're wearing this plastic bag when you were trekking, please? Now that's Morocco, I know. <laughs> and I do recall, everybody said the weather is going to be absolutely wonderful. And then within the guidance on what to take with you, it said, do take a light cagoule in case there's an evening shower and we had 24 36 hours of deluge rain and i'd forgotten my light cagoule and the only thing that i could use at all to protect myself from the, from this terrible rain uh, was that we noticed there were quite a lot of uh, poo bell dustbins around and that if you made a hole in it you could use it and you can tell by this it was no longer raining and so I was out in the sunshine <laughs> drying out <laughs> and enjoying the fact that it had stopped raining but it was very very tough that 24 hours 36 hours of rain. I do remember well next slide please 
Okay, so this is Ethiopia, which of course now is uh, unfortunately uh, involved in uh, um, a military strife in the north part of the country. So I don't think you could go to the Simeon Mines. Just tell us a little bit about this group, uh, Marcus. Um, well, they were a fantastic group. I mean, it probably was in some ways one of the toughest treks we'd done. And quite a lot of people, like I can see there, Claire Mellon, who's a gynecologist, had never done anything like that at all before. Uh, and and um, th it, was a, it was a much smaller group than we'd had on many of the others. I think there were only, what, uh, there were other 25 or something people. But so we were a very close group. Uh, and there was something very exciting being in this country that has had such a lot of political and military problems, uh, but which was just opening up and becoming alive. And it is a fabulous country with wonderful people, just, you know, such wonderful people. Uh, and it was a very special trek. You've probably got some tales to tell about it, Roger, but I guess you're not here to do that. <laughs> no, 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 we want to hear from you. Actually, let's, let's go over to Will now. Will, t just tell us a little bit about um, your background, Will. I've already mentioned that you've got a favorite, uh, a very famous dad, and it's not always easy, I think, having a, a famous dad. So uh, tell us a little bit about the Greenwich Project first, and then we'll go over to... Uh, to talk about the Bart's project, which Marcus and you are very involved together in. So, Will. Thanks, Roger. Yeah, I think the first thing to say is I don't come from a medical background at all. In fact, I was pretty hopeless at science. Um, but I did end up studying architectural history, which eventually, after many twists and turns, led me to Greenwich, the old Royal Naval College, where I took on the role as the director of conservation. And um, I really, um, it was a lucky break for lots of reasons, um, one of which was that I um, was able to take on an amazing project, which was the conservation of the Great Painted Hall at Greenwich. And um, I think there's a video to introduce Greenwich to some of you who may not know the site very well, if it works. So this is the old Royal Naval College, um, built as the Royal Hospital for Seamen at the beginning um, of the um, 18th century. Um, it's a spectacular collection of Baroque buildings. And um, I, I always show this film because it gives some idea of the drama and the grandeur of the site. And with its famous twin domes, um, the buildings were master planned by an architect we all know called Sir Christopher Wren and completed over a period of 50 years by a succession of other architects. Wren very cleverly built the foundations early on so no one could deviate from his plan too much. Um, the dome on the right hand side is on um, the painted hall itself which is the sort of ceremonial heart of the site. It was built as a grand ceremonial dining room um, designed mostly by um, another wonderful Baroque architect called Nicholas Hawksmoor. And the idea was that you would come to Greenwich, you would go to the Painted Hall and you would be completely overwhelmed and amazed by what you see. And um, it was designed to convey this message that England was catching up with the rest of Europe culturally. We've got the architecture you can see, but the painted hall was decorated by another Englishman called Sir James Thornhill, who was the father-in-law of William Hogarth, who decorated the staircase at Bart's in the North Wing. Um, and he painted over a period of 20 years about 40 or 50,000 square feet of paint of, of um, surface inside the painted hall. And it was this space that we began a massive conservation project on in 2016. Um, and I think there's a, there's a slide um, showing the scaffolding that we built inside the hall, which was an amazing thing. Um, it was designed not just to give the conservators access to the ceiling to do their work, but we designed it to allow full public access. So that white sort of pillar in the background is a lift. There were two wide staircases and we invited the public up to come and watch the conservation work underway. And we had about 90, 
thousand visitors during the project. I think there's a slide of the top deck. Yeah, it was a very weird experience to be up um, high up on the deck, very close to these amazing paintings. That's William and Mary, the founders of the um, Royal Naval Hospital in the centre. Um, you can't see in this slide, but one of the things we discovered when we were um, undertaking the project was that the um, restorers over the centuries, people that had gone up there and done work prior to us, had all left signatures in various parts of the, the, the painting. And um, one had actually signed the bosom of Queen Mary. Um, and uh, uh, we um, were able to point that out during these tours with the public. Um, there's another slide, I think, just showing the conservators doing their work. There they were. Um, it took about two years to complete the cleaning and the conservation of the painted surface. Um, and we communicated during this time to the public exactly what we were doing. And people wanted to know the science of the conservation and were amazed and, uh, and um, uh, intrigued by the, 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 the actual science of what we were doing, which was... Um, um, which was a surprise to me and, and a great a great addition to the project. And I think um, there's probably just one more slide. Yeah, this is the finished painted hall, um, which uh, reopened last year. Um, and uh, if you haven't been there, um, you must go and visit. It, it will hopefully reopen after uh, lockdown in December. Let me interrupt there, uh, Will, and, and go uh, before you tell us about how you're doing with the Great Hall of Baths. Um, Marcus, can you tell us a little bit about you know the background to to the story uh, with at Baths? Because you know th this isn't something that came about overnight. It, it, I know you've been working on this for years and years. Um, well, you're, you're right. Uh, I mean, the story of Baths, as you know, goes back to the year 1123. So there's an awful lot of history and heritage around Bath's. Uh, and I would say that in my early life as a student at Bath's, uh, it was something that impressed me, but I didn't take a great interest. And it was really only as I got uh, older, I really began to love and cherish this great hall and, and the whole of the square of Barts and the fountain and the, and the Henry VIII gatehouse. Um, and then really the thing that kicked it off for, for me was um, Professor Gerald Libby, who's a psychiatrist. I often refer to him as my psychiatrist. I used to, when I was referring patients, because then they felt more comfortable about being refer referred to as psychiatrist. Um, but uh, he um, came up with the, I, or the realization that uh, since the Great Hall um, was built, it was well looked after by the City of London. But when in 1948 the National Health Service was formed, uh, it's, it didn't have such a direct function. It was basically used as the central administrative managerial building of Bart's Hospital. Uh, but then um, the, it began to fall into slight decline and, and less usage. Uh, and by the time about 10 years ago, that Gerald Libby had really realized that it was in poor condition. Four of us, he got, he got four of us together, known as the Gang of Four, who formed the Friends of the Great Hall. And we really just thought we were going to support and help and encourage restoration. But what we actually had to do was run a campaign uh, to allow this to happen. And, and as a result of it, uh, 10 years of campaigning or eight years of campaigning, the um, health, Bart's Health NHS Trust could see the point of making about a heritage trust and separating it from their responsibility. And then we met Will Palin fairly, well, later on in the time when we were about to become a heritage trust, trust and he helped us enormously. And by amazingly good fortune, his previous job ended just about when we, uh, or, or had been completed the project. Uh, and he saw the, or he knew about the job we were advertising uh, and he was appointed. And it's been 
uh, a marriage made in heaven. So let's go back to Will. Will, tell us about the restoration. Then I think Marcus will get you back again to tell us about fundraising in general and, you know, in the difficult post-COVID, well, uh, the COVID era that we're in, uh, the challenges uh, associated with fundraising, all sorts of charities. But Will, uh, let's go back to your slides again and tell us a little bit about how you see this project developing. Yeah, if we can have the next slide, Victor. Um, yeah, so first of all, to talk about the, the buildings um, that we um, are taking over at Barts, the North Wing and the Henry Gate Gatehouse, um, they are substantial buildings and they need a lot of work. In fact, in terms of project cost, it's about twice as much as, it's gonna cost twice as much as a project to conserve the, the painted hall. So that gives you an idea of the scale of the task ahead. Um, we, um, uh, we, we recognize that ra raising 23 million pounds at this particular moment in time, is going to be a particularly uh, challenging thing to do. So um, we have split the project into two main phases. The first phase will tackle all that, um, key important work to the fabric of the north wing and the gatehouse um, including the the roof and the masonry and the windows and then we'll also be um, undertaking a, a full conservation um, project in the two wonderful spaces the Hogarth stair which you're looking at at the moment and the great hall which we'll 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 look at um, um, later on um, but here is the, the wonderful staircase hall in the North Wing. Um, when the North Wing was completed, the governess of the hospital were going to give the, the, the um, commission to decorate the staircase to an Italian called Amiconi. Um, but um, uh, another English artist called William Hogarth, who I mentioned before, who was born um, uh, adjacent to the hospital and whose mother and sister actually lived in the hospital complex so he knew it very well. He was doing very well, he was becoming a celebrated figure and he thought this was his opportunity to do a grand um, mural painting and uh, he barged his way to the front, um, got the commission, offered to do it for nothing and produced these two amazing works which were actually on canvas um, and um, uh, attached to the walls and the pool of Bethesda, which is the one directly ahead, and the Good Samaritan, the, the painting um, um, on your left, if you're looking at the, the, these slides. Um, this is a wonderful space. It's a little known treasure in London. Um, it needs quite a lot of work. Um, there is work to be done, not just on the con conservation of the surfaces, but the whole representation of this space to make it really come to life again. And you see that um, slide on the right with the nurses in the 1960s, with those wonderful gas lamps on the staircase, which I'm quite keen to, to put back at some point. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, the, 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 the Hogarth stair is, is, as I said, one of the two great showpiece interiors. It's part of that theatrical procession of spaces that that you experience coming here and it was designed to enchant and seduce people into supporting and um, uh, donating towards the hospital project a bit like Greenwich. The North Wing where these interiors are was built first, it was the administrative block and it was used as a sort of fundraising tool to complete the other um, three sides of the great square designed by the architect James Gibbs. Um, we'll, we'll move on to the next slide, but I just want to interrupt because there's a question um, for Marcus from Mary Hawking. And, and Mary says, I was at Bart's and he, she, she says it owned at one time most of the ground rent of the City of London. And the Great Hall is panelled with the names of donors. You can see uh, that on this slide. What happened to those endowments uh, which have been accrued since 1123? That's quite a good question. Well, I mean, I think they were used for running the hospital and indeed some of them were used for building the hospital. I mean, it cost, um, apparently the North Wing itself cost the only, the, the amazingly small sum of £20,000. But there are three other big wings of the hospital and the, the actual process of, 
of, of fundraising for them and building them, I think was spanned between about 1730 and 1760. Uh, so, uh, and, and then forever thereafter, once it had been built and established as a big major hospital, um, the running costs were, were the responsibility of the, of the city of London. Um, Henry VIII had closed the hospital and the Priory Church attached to it. Uh, and then uh, after um, he destroyed much of the Priory, the sort of monastery, if you like, um, he responded to public appeals to, re to reopen the hospital. And he did so, or allowed it to be reopened. It probably never did completely close, uh, but he transferred the responsibility for funding it to, from the Crown to the City of London. So uh, the, one of the great uses and why they built the Great Hall first was to have a grand space to invite wealthy merchants and tradespeople to come in and see the, this, this powerful uh, um, expression of philanthropy. And that if they paid a substantial, gave or donated it substantially, they could have their names um, in, inscribed on the wall. Um, so, I mean, that's how the hospital had, had it, it was a, it was a charitable, a philanthropic hospital until 1948, like all the London teaching hospitals. Yeah. So there they are, and there are still a few spaces of blank walls you can see in the, in, in the inlets of the windows. So those who donate really generously, <laughs> haven't quite decided what the threshold will be, can have their names inscribed on the wall. We've got room for what will, will, will they tell us how many spaces there are, 60 or 100 spaces? <laughs> well, before we go back to Will, Marcus, uh, yeah. I mean, look, looking at that picture, uh, it, it looks so glorious. You, you think, well, where is, uh, why, why do we need 20 million pounds plus to, to restore it? But I think you were saying it, it, that, that the, photo the photograph doesn't tell you the whole story. No, actually, if you look very carefully in the top left-hand corner of the far wall, the walls, of, is, it isn't just shadow, it's, uh, it's where it, the paint's blistered um, and, and discolored uh, and on a rainy evening, you'll see tr trickles of water coming down. If you look at the windowsills uh, uh, on the windows that most of which don't open, but on the windowsills, if you, at the ground floor level, if you put a hand on it, you'll come away with a handful of wind, windowsill so I mean there are lots and lots of major and the entire roof basically it needs re-roofing re re so there's and, and, the, and even though the ceiling looks lovely it's actually um, well I don't know Will will tell you whether it's half as good as it could, could be or three quarters as good but it but it needs a lot of restoration it's both structural and in, interior Right, that's, that's a good cue for Will. Will, tell us what you're going to do. Well, um, as Marcus said, appearances are deceptive and this in this photograph, the hall looks sort of okay, but there's lots of issues. Um, the, the, the main problems are to do with water ingress. So we need to, um, as Marcus said, completely redo the roof. Um, and then in terms of the surfaces inside the, the Great Hall, we need to get up there and do a proper conservation job to the ceiling. Um, there, there are cracks, there's a lot of paint peeling, there are areas where we are concerned there might there may be plaster, um, the risk of plaster falling, so we need to get up there and really nurse and love the ceiling back to life. And then the walls, similarly tired, there's lots of areas where there's water staining, cracking, so there's a major job to conserve those and, and also to look after these beautiful donor plaques, which are wonderful works of art in themselves. And we want to make sure that they are properly um, uh, looked after. And as Mark has also said, there is some space for new uh, donor names. So we're going to be continuing that great tradition. I think we've worked out it's 50,000 pounds will buy you your name on the, the Great Hall somewhere. Um, so um, we are um, we're, we're open to, to offers um, if anybody watching this seminar is uh, 
is uh, keen to help. Great. Uh, so, Marcus, tell, tell us a little bit then about, you know, the, f your experience of fundraising, because I, I wanted to also to talk about uh, your role in well-being of women um, uh, as a, I know you've been involved in that for many years. Yeah. And the story, a bit of a story about how that was uh, linked very strongly with the Royal College of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology and then set out to, separate, to separate. Tell us um, a story. Yes, well, it, it was founded, um, it, it, it arose because the professor at University College Hospital had a research fund uh, and he was retiring. And I think he felt that it was wrong to have a, a quite a big fund uh, that, that only uh, gave grants to one of the London teaching hospitals. Uh, and that in fact it, it could become a bigger charity if it actually gave research grants to hospitals throughout the United Kingdom. And so he and some colleagues around that time, um, which I ought to remember again the, the year it started, but it must have been something like the 50s or 60s, uh, uh, and they um, initially it had um, when they, well, I think they called it just the, the, the Royal College uh, Research Fund. And then after a little while, they cha changed the name to Birthright. And it was Birthright for oh, at least 20, 30 years uh, when his name was changed again, because the name got confused with uh, Right to Life organizations. Um, and so it, they changed it to Wellbeing of Women, and that's been the name for at least 30 years. And in fact, George Pinker was another, was a great supporter of it. And when it first began, or when in for many years, uh, it was heavily supported by uh, obstetricians and gynaecologists, and its offices were in the Royal College. Uh, but then um, about a decade ago, there was some disagreements with the Royal College uh, and so well-being decided it was better to uh, be sort of spatially uh, removed and to operate more independently. Uh, but in fact, it's now highly likely that it's going to move back into the new Royal College because the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology in Regent's Park realised that they uh, can, in, are no longer in the future going to be able to afford uh, to be housed in a beautiful um, building in Regent's Park that is just uh, beyond uh, reasonable running costs. So they have now moved just very, very recently, just around Christmas time last year, uh, to, um, <coughs> to Southwark, to a, 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 a much less uh, a pre prestigious uh, locality, but all the young fellows and members and the staff think they'd much rather be in swinging Southwark than than in Regent's Park, uh, and and so it looks very likely that Wellbeing will return it, its offices will return there as well. But as you say, it's been a really really tough year for for all charities. I mean, uh, and, and one only realizes what a huge number of charities there are in this country and some organizations which perhaps not all of us appreciated were charities like the Royal Society of Medicine um, have had extreme difficulty in maintaining income during this year. Well, certainly the, uh, uh, the Royal Society of Medicine, you know, is uh, we are, looks like we're going to lose about four million pounds this year because we've had to close our building so we can't rent out our lecture theatres, mm. our hotel, our restaurant and so on. So uh, yeah, we, we are uh, experiencing some difficulties and uh, we are grateful for the help of any of our members, any of the viewers here. Um, just before we leave WOW, I, I think you've got a new chairman. You're president of WOW, but haven't you got a new chairman? Is that right? Um, we have indeed. Uh, and we had the most wonderful chairman for something like 30 years, Sir Victor Blank, who just gave his life and soul and money uh, to the charity. 
Um, he runs an annual cricket match at his uh, house where there's a lovely flat lawn which is converted into a cricket pitch. Every year that makes a quarter of a million consistently. But anyway, he, he decided that he really needed to stand down uh, and we were very delighted that uh, the outgoing president of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology was approached and is accepted to be the chairman of wellbeing and that's Professor Dame Leslie Reagan, who's a really strong, uh, charming, um, but determined uh, professor of obstetrics and gynaecology. And it's the first time we've had a chairman from the profession. Uh, and my role as honorary president is um, really a, a, a more titular. I mean, I go to lots of its events and I help to fundraise, but I don't have any executive role, thank heavens. <laughs> so, and, and similarly, um, I mean, I don't really have an executive role. I'm a trustee of Her Bart's Heritage uh, and I'm a trustee of two or three other charities. Uh, so I do spend a lot of my time um, hearing how difficult it is for money to be raised. And yet, amazingly, there are still uh, sources and there are very helpful um, government grants, uh, Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, you know, it's not it's not an entirely sort of a sterile, dry period for charities. Um, the British public responds uh, and so does business and so do um, her charitable foundations uh, are still uh, have some money to but it, it's the fundraising from events that's been so hit hard because you can't do those events will I, I think the, the timing of this um, this webinar is opportune because I think you have a uh, a, an announcement to make about a, a patron, a certain patron of uh, Bart's Heritage. You, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yes, and this is thanks mainly to Marcus's wonderful efforts um, in the background. But um, we have a, a new patron, um, uh, the Prince of Wales, which is um, wonderful news for us. Um, he's taken on the patronage of Bart's Heritage for the duration of our fundraising appeal. So that's going to be a tremendous boost to us and will be um, incredibly helpful um, during the, the um, fundraising campaign. And, and, and the other, and it's a question to both of you really, because um, Bart's was founded, famously founded, the oldest hospital on its original site in Europe, I think in 1123. And uh, if my calculations are right, in, that'll be exactly 900 years ago in, um, in three years from now. So uh, the ninth, uh, 900th anniversary of St. Bartholomew's Hospital has got to be uh, something that you can tie your fundraising endeavors to. Is that right? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think, Will, you should um, t talk about some of the really important events that are being planned for 2023. Um, but also we've got a lot of plans for fundraising in the two, two or three years leading up to that. Yes. Uh, I mean, Tell us about those, Will. Well, I mean, there, there's very few institutions that reach 900 in, in age and um, we are going to make the most of it. And I think it's really important to make the point that we're just one component of the Bart's family. So there's past, present and future, I suppose. There's us there's um, the working hospital, there's the hospital charity as well. And we're all um, uh, intending to, to, as I said, make the most of that 900th anniversary opportunity and raise money for a range of projects across the hospital, culminating in, you know, wonderful party at Bart's in the Great Hall, a service in St. Bartholomew's the Great, even Song in St. Paul's, and the City of London are going to be looking after us very well. So there'll be all sorts of um, things to mark the culmination of the fundraising um, appeal, and um, uh, and lots of lots of other things on the on on route um, over the next couple of years to look forward to, um, and certainly from the heritage point of view, we we very much want to um, get 
people up on the scaffolding when we start our works um, in 22-23 as part of that sort of um, celebration to, um, to demonstrate to everybody that the place is in good hands and has got another hopefully 900 years um, to go. And of course, it, it, I'm not giving away any secrets uh, in saying your father, who I hope is watching, hello again, Sir Michael, uh, he was treated by uh, the cardiac department. Bart's now is very, very famous for its cardiac uh, care. It's the biggest cardiological unit uh, in Europe. Fantastic heart uh, attack service. Um, tell us a little bit about, about uh, Sir Michael and, and his... Uh, uh, cardiac ex experience. They look after him nicely. I think he, when he did the In Conversation series, he, he mentioned it. Yeah, I mean, it was pure coincidence, really. But when I started, or well, I was about to start at, 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 at Bart's, at the Bart's Heritage, um, my father um, um, was booked in to have um, some heart surgery done, some, some valves looked at and replaced. Um, and uh, so I was able to um, leave my day job at Greenwich um, uh, under the pretense that I was going to visit my father, which of course I, I was doing, but I was also having an interview with um, the, the trustees of Bart's Heritage. So I went to see him and I realised quite quickly he was in very good hands and um, he's made a, a full and fairly speedy recovery. Um, and uh, part of that recovery, interestingly, when he was at Bart's was um, he was wheeled over and taken to look at the Hogarth stair and that was nothing to do with me. That was um, what his cardiac nurse decided to do as part of his recovery. Um, and uh, there's some rather wonderful photographs of him looking a little bit pale and bewildered um, in, in the Hogarth stair, um, which um, uh, I think is, is a rather uh, lo lovely way of making that link between heritage and health, because this isn't just about restoring an old building, it's about being at the centre of the working hospital and, and, and helping the patients and the staff have a little bit of a break from the clinical environment into beautiful places where they can relax and um, and, and hopefully recover. And, and Marcus, uh, you know, we're talking about 700 years of, of Bart's, but um, you remember I was a consultant for 10 years at, at Bart's during the, its most difficult time when um, Mrs. Bottomley, Brian Mulwinney, and uh, the, the uh, amazing Mrs. Thatcher took aim at uh, Bart's, and it, it very nearly closed, didn't it? Just tell us a little bit about the, the narrow shave that uh, we encountered in those years. And, and that, they, they were very traumatic years. I, I myself was very uh, involved in that. Yeah. Well, in, indeed. And I mean, the, you're quite right. The decision by government had actually been made uh, and fixed that it was to be closed down. Uh, and there was a famous uh, quotation that people used to say that Virginia Bottomley said, uh, it's totally inappropriate to have a hospital in the city. Uh, uh, it should be closed down and made into a museum. Uh, and there was terrific campaign then for saving the hospital run by all sorts of different people. The city had a very strong role, the staff of the hospital did. There was um, the, for the, a unique thing that they were allowed in the Lord Mayor's parade, when the new Lord Mayor comes in, they were allowed to have a, a float in the Lord Mayor's parade uh, with a political message, which is not normally allowed, but the city itself felt so uh, determined that the hospital shouldn't be closed. So um, uh, it, um, the, it, was, it was all signed and sealed, but then when Tony Blair's government came into power uh, shortly before the closure had been sort of instituted, um, it, he changed the decision, reversed it, and said the hospital was to remain open, that it may should be explored as to whether it should become a more sub-specialized hospital, uh, but, uh, he and his and, and everybody was convinced that it had a, a, a still had a very important role uh, and and it's absolutely flourished since that time and did, didn't you have some connection with tony blair um 
uh, he, I did once see, I saw him in the antenatal clinic actually, but he, since he reports that publicly, I don't feel I'm breaking any patient confidentiality. Uh, but in fact, um, you know, she, she, his first two children were born at Bart, so he kind of knew the place quite well. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, he he did literally save the day. It was, it was one of the first things he did was in coming to about. Must have been nineteen ninety seven, uh, I think. Uh, Marcus, there's a question here um, from Russell Locke, who I'm sure you know. Uh, yeah. Russell says, moving from Barts, you arrived at another ancient institution, the Whittington Hospital, uh, to encounter the Cat and Jenner's cattle, whatever that <laughs> means. Um, the Whittington was an ancient leper colony for Barts. Did this stimulate your move? <laughs> um, no, I didn't know about the leper colony until quite recently. But no, what stimulated my move was I had a slightly uh, unusual um, career as a consultant at Barts. I went there as a consultant uh, in 1975. And when I'd been there about 10 years, uh, it was decided they were going to close down obstetrics at Barts uh, because it was a fairly small obstetric unit with a small population. And so the, uh, that service was moved to the new Homerton Hospital in Hackney. And so I then suddenly had found my job split into two sites, gynaecology at Barts and obstetrics at Homerton. And I sustained that quite reasonably comfortably, but with a lot of travel for 15 years. Uh, and then um, uh, it was decided, sorry, more like 25 years, actually, it was 25 years. Um, they decided that half of my gynecological time was to be spent at the Royal London Hospital and half at Bart's and the other half of my working life at Homerton. Uh, and there was this small matter of a private practice in Harley Street, and I realised that it was just undoable. So with great sadness, I um, decided to leave Barts. And at the time, there happened to be a job advertised at the Whittington. So at the age of 56, I applied for a new job uh, at the Whittington, which was 10 minutes from where I live uh, um, and where we'd lived for many years. Uh, all on one site for the NHS. And I actually had nine or 10 very happy years at the Whittington as well. And that's, that's a hospital that's proud of its heritage too. Yeah. And we should say Claire Mellon is the lead going, uh, obstetrician at, um, at the Whittington, is a fantastic person. And, and she, as you say, she trekked so bravely with us in Ethiopia. Brilliant. Um, Lin Lindsay Nichols says, Sir Marcus, she calls you Sir Marcus, um, what made you choose the specialty of obstetrics and gynaecology and what advice would you offer to medical students considering this career path now? Because, you know, there is some controversy in various ONG uh, institutions, uh, particularly in the, towards the north of England. Any, any words of advice for young clinicians? It's still a wonderful specialty. And it, it, I mean, it is... There, there can be no, no other specialty that celebrates the joys of birth and life so frequently. Um, but, but gynaecology is also a wonderful specialty because women are very special people. Men are as well, but women have added specialty. Uh, and it's a very, very rewarding career to do. Um, I mean, I would say it is quite tough because you inevitably, it's a 24 hour service. Uh, so you, you can't escape from quite a lot of night work. Um, but I enjoyed every single year of it right up from the first time I was appointed a consultant. Well, from, from when I was a medical student, I enjoyed it. And I think that's when I first got interested uh, and then I enjoyed the early jobs. Um, I traveled quite a lot in those early jobs. I worked in Jamaica, in um, the University Hospital in Kingston. I worked in Oxford. I worked in Southampton, uh, Torquay. So I saw a lot of the country in a lot of different hospitals and really feel very fortunate to have had this career. I think it is, has added toughness now 
because um, there's a terrific fear of litigation uh, because litigation following the trends of the United States become much more common. And in some cases that's very appropriate, but it does put an additional stress on people in their daily um, working life and job. Well, uh, we're getting a few greetings. Bruce Farley says hello. Michael Dooley's just uh, sent me a message on LinkedIn. And um, the very famous uh, gyne gyno-oncologist, or if I'm saying that right, gyneco-oncologist, John, Professor John Shepherd, has got a question for Will, probably the last question, Will. Um, this is a technical question, actually. What's your opinion of the recent addition on the right side of the entrance to the Great Hall and the Grand Staircase? Is this in keeping with the architecture of the day as designed by James Gibb? <laughs> That's a controversial question. Yeah. Well done, John. Thank you for that question. I think you know the answer. I, I, I don't think it's in keeping, but I don't think it was intended to be in keeping. It was meant to be a sort of, you know, um, a, a modern building speaking its own language. Just tell everybody about, a little bit about the building. They won't all know. Uh, it's the Maggie Centre, um, which is by an American architect called Stephen Hull um, and was completed, um, Marcus will correct me, about four, four years ago, three or four years yeah. ago. Um, and it is, it is, you know, it, it's not of the same classical language as the other buildings around the square, um, but it has a sort of simplicity to it and, and I think um, a beauty of its own. Um, and um, it's, um, uh, we are lucky enough to have broken an agreement with with Maggie's, which means that there's a link building between us and the Maggie Centre, which provides a staircase, lift and lose and all those important things that we're going to need when um, the, the Great Hall is being used for functions. So um, um, we, we benefited in, in that regard. And a lot of that was down to the very hard work of Marcus and Gerald and the others in the early, early days. Well, it's, it's, we're running out of time. I, I should also mention, we mentioned the uh, amazing cardiology centre at Barts, but uh, it's not only a fantastic cardiology centre, they've got a great um, oncology cancer centre there. They were a, a very good CEO, Sir Charles Knight, cardiologist, uh, who also runs the Nightingale Hospital in, um, uh, in Olympic Park. So uh, I, I think this, the future of, of, of this famous institution is, is secure. And uh, congratulations uh, to you, Marcus, and, and to you, Will, for the great work you're doing in, in, in terms of heritage and, and keeping, uh, restoring that wonderful uh, location, the Great Hall, back to its former magnificence uh, and Henry VIII Gate, of course. So uh, don't go away because I've got one or two announcements to make. Um, uh, thank you so much, everybody, for listening. I'm sorry I didn't get to ask all of your questions, but we got through quite a few. Um, the uh, Tomorrow we have our COVID-19 RSM webinar at 12.30, and we're talking about the African experience uh, of COVID, very different from, uh, from the North American and European experience, so do tune into that. Next week, uh, in, in conversation, we have uh, Baroness Biban Kidron, OBE, filmmaker, uh, parliamentarian, digital transformation uh, with regard to children expert. And the week after that, we've uh, actually, thanks to Marcus's uh, intervention, we have Lord uh, Mervyn King, ex-governor uh, of the Bank of England. So oh, a tennis player like Mike, we didn't get a chance to talk about the tennis, unfortunately, Marcus. Um, but Lord King will be interviewed by me again. I've got, you've got me again. And uh, I shall also the day after that, Jane McQuitty is doing another of our uh, wine tasting uh, experiences with uh, uh, Liberty Wines. Uh, uh, David from Liberty Wines will be joining Jane. And they've chosen four... Uh, special Christmas wines, which you can uh, uh, order and then listen to that uh, uh, webinar at seven o'clock in the evening on uh, Thursday, the 3rd of December. So uh, just a final uh, thing to say is that uh, you've heard about how uh, Marcus and Will are raising money for their venture. Of course, uh, the RSM is under the cosh because of COVID. So if you're feeling generous for any of these charitable uh, uh, institutions, RSM founded in uh, 1805, uh, been around for 215 years, not as long as Bart's, but uh, we want to stay around for another 215 years at least, and we will need your help to do that. So thank you for joining all of us. Thank you, Will, 
regards to your dad. Uh, thank you, Marcus. Regards to your wife, Sarah, who was flitting in and out of our, uh, your Zoom <laughs> picture earlier in the evening when we were practicing. Uh, and uh, have a wonderful evening, everybody. And we'll see you hopefully tomorrow and uh, again next week. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Bye.